what keep a theater company alive? Money. <laughs> Simple. If you may have the best ideas of the world, and people will be coming, but uh, every day they must eat. And if you are not able to provide food for them, they have to go and work somewhere else. And therefore, you have not a company, a permanent company. So I could say that when we began, we began as amateur, and an amateur is independent because he is not dependent on spectators. They are working. They were all of us working outside. I was not working because my wife was working. She was maintaining me, so I was lucky in this way. So I could really dedicate myself. Thanks to her, until today, I am independent so that I don't uh, am bound to economical problems. But in the beginning, we were paying out our own pockets. And they were young people, 18, 19 years. They were living with their family, and their family were providing for them. How luck was that a, when we were as an amateur theater traveling and performing, a woman from Hostelbro, a nurse who also was working in a amateur theater in Hostelbro. There was no theater in Hostelbro, no building. There was an amateur theater. Because amateur theater is a very, very rooted Still today, even in Osterbro, there are several amateur companies all over uh, the world where you go, you find amateur companies. <coughs> and why they are doing this? Because uh, they are not interesting, this is the difference with professional act, uh, actors in theater. The amateur does for their own gratification. So it is a sort of being together and creating some certain things in their community, a friendship. A, a, a professional actor works in order to gratify the spectators. It's very, very different, the, the conditions of work or the motivations. But this nurse come and watches Odin Theater in Viborg, a town 50 kilometers from here. We were performing, as I told you, at the very, very beginning. We was probably one of the first companies at that time who didn't need a building, a theater building. So we were performing in a museum, in one of the rooms of the museum. Uh, and uh, she saw this performance. She was struck by the performance. She came back here. Now, Hollisburg was a town in the 60s who was simply uh, losing, uh, demographically, people were leaving. There was no high school here. So boys and girls who want to continue studying left. And uh, there was only one factory. It, it, it was always a commercial center for the peasants of the region, Osterbro. So the only factory closed, it was a rather big factory, so about 150 families suddenly lost their subsistence. In the, uh, in the mayor of the town, who was a postman, he was a postman who was part of the trade unions, social democratic, he was elected as mayor, and he asked himself why people, doctors, don't want to come to Horstebro, dentists don't want to come to Horstebro, teachers don't want to come to Horstebro, because they say that nothing happens here. But, and here you see what it means to be a creative person. 
He says, nothing happens here, and he transposed this sentence into something which can be uh, a point of departure for action. So he says, nothing happens here because there is no culture. This is, he explains this, nothing happens because these people, they want culture. So he decides, okay, we will be give them culture. And then what does he do? He doesn't know anything as postman. So he goes and manages to find, to discover there is newly been established a Ministry of Culture here. And the Ministry of Culture is interested, because, in spreading culture in the province also, not only in the big towns where it's concentrated. And he managed to find a, a, an author, a, a, a rather very good author, a novelist, his name is Paul Ball, who was also an expert in art. So this, he came and said, okay, we can start by building a museum. But we have not much money, so we will do this museum in this way. And, and this, from this you learn a lot of things. We, are, we can't buy uh, art which is already established. It's too expensive. But I know a few young painters whom I believe they will be famous. So let's start buying them. So he begin, they begin to buy the, the five, they concentrate on five of, of them. Uh, and then they became very well known. And then the house, just a house, the municipality bought a house, a villa. And they start making this museum. I, I tell you about this museum because it shows how the uh, Paul Vard was extraordinary. So what he thinks, Paul Vard, he, uh, he has friends. One of his friends is a, a sculptor. The sculptor is very interested in African uh, masks. And he has been buying all his life uh, African art. He has more than 400 pieces in, in his home, so he doesn't know what to do. And Paul said, why don't you take and put them in Orsebro? And then he accepts. And Paul, uh, Holm his name, he comes and uh, uh, gives or deposits the, this extraordinary collection. When he dies, he is buried in the museum, in the garden of the museum. Paul Bath continues. Ah, so he, this is... Danish, very Danish, then we open to the world, African art, and then he says, indeed, the masters of inter, uh, international masters, painters, who have completely changed the uh, way of looking at, the, uh, at art. So he thinks of Picasso, he thinks of Matisse, he thinks of Chagall, he thinks of Giacometti, so we can't buy paintings of them, but we can buy original prints, which are much uh, more exp less expensive. So he begins to buy, manages to buy, uh, also helped by the state, who uh, also be, uh, arrives, becomes a sort of strange place where completely in the desert they are building a museum, very original museum. Well, in this situation, the nurse who has been reading in the local newspaper that the mayor said we must have culture so that dentists and, <laughs> and engineers come here. Sees the performance and she re re read, she had uh, been reading an interview I had been giving that we were, I said, I, we are li working in Oslo, but I want to go and work in a smaller town. This was my uh, aim. So she says, fantastic. Uh, she comes back, she calls the mayor, this is the advantage of living in a small place, and says, I've seen a performance, fantastic, a theater, I heard that the director wants to move this to a province, why don't you invite them? So they come. 
she of course didn't tell him that we were Norwegians. We were living in Norway and we had a completely different language than the Danes. Yeah. But the most unbelievable thing is that the mayor says, give me one hour, call me back in one hour. And then when she uh, calls again, he said, give me the address of this theater. So I received a letter from Horst Brumeyer asking me to come and negotiate the possibility of transferring Odin Theater from Oslo to Holstebro. What is this Holstebro <laughs> begin? Now, I must say that I've been studying uh, Norwegian literature and in Oslo, and, uh, and um, uh, uh, I had also to study part of the other Scandinavian uh, literature, Swedish and Danish. And we had a Danish uh, professor there, uh, teacher, and I must say I detested <laughs> that because Danish is very, very different from Norwegian. Norwegian is very beautiful as a language. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy really speaking, I told you this. Danish is for me a very, mm, very difficult to mm, physically be <laughs> <laughs> fascinated. <laughs> so, Denmark, I have to go to Denmark where they speak like this, all right, but bread <laughs> is bread. And then I decided to go and speak. They accepted, yes, uh, they accepted this theater, although it was Norwegian, because the, I was not asking for a building. For the main, main, main problem is if they are, are going to have a theater, they must have a building. They, they don't know this building. I said, no, I just want an empty space, an empty room there. They were, at that moment, thinking of a, um, of, of, of um, uh, putting together, of melting two towns, Stuart, which is about 11 kilometers from here. And therefore, all the uh, expansion of the town should go in that direction. So they had been buying many properties, firms, uh, uh, and factories, houses in the, in, in the country. So they showed me all these houses in the country because they had nothing in town. And there was this thought surrounded. The town was at almost two kilometers from here. So it was surrounded. Fantastic. I mean, this was just a, a, a gift. We accepted, but, and here comes a, a situation which had a huge uh, consequences for me and also for you. <laughs> uh, when we start dealing, we got this place and they gave us a small amount of money which corresponded to this a year salary of a unskilled worker for 60,000 crowns. So very, very little. When we arrived from Norway, we were five, and when the first ensemble with all their actors from other Scandinavian countries, we were eight people. We had to live with this. And these obliged us to invent many other activities because we could not just live out of performances. But when <clears throat> I was uh, just in, before signing, well, we didn't sign. This is also very characteristic. This is a very particular region in Denmark where people speak little and watch very much how you behave. And when they deal with you, at the end is just shaking hands and this is. Well, so at the end, we, I, we, I and the manager sh sh um, sh 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 shake hands, but before we did it, I said, I accept on one condition that this will be a theater laboratory. No problem, Barbara, he said, it can be a theater laboratory. By the way, what it is, a theater laboratory? And then I answered, it is a theater which does not perform every evening, like all other theaters. He accepted. He found it very normal and natural that one. So, but I remained 
facing this question. If I read an ensemble of actors am not performing every day, what am I doing the rest <laughs> all the time? Something I have to do to justify the time at theater. Because same, always theater, this is the essence. All right, we had the problem that we should learn. We were autodidacts. So pedagogy became very important. And here and there, these buildings, what today is very normal, workshops, seminars, courses, massacre, began because it didn't exist before. Before, it was unthinkable that professional actors, because it exists only professional actors, it didn't exist this other big culture of uh, groups, projects, uh, artists, uh, performance happenings, uh, um, applied theater, theater in the community, theater in prison, or theater among the, 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 the madmen in, you know, in psychiatric hospital. All this didn't exist in 1966. Theater were fun noble, I would say noble buildings where we could go in and see performances or for entertainment or for a sort of cultural food. So we start, I, I had, I was a very good contact with Grotowski. He had problems in coming out from Poland because uh, the authorities were not seeing very well to what the type of performances he was doing. So I thought, ah, I can invite him. I, I was very interested in spreading his name. I had been publishing even a book about him. Uh, I was a sort of uh, agit prop for his ideas. So I said, I can present him, his activities here. So I invited him with one of his actors to do, I call it seminar, <laughs> because at that time, it existed in Scandinavia something which the union, the uh, actors' union, directors' union, the theater unions, the nationals uh, in Scandinavia, the national uh, trade union, um, had created, it was called uh, Vasa Seminar. Vasa is a town in Finland and the seminar is a, a, a moment where all the professionals were gathering to discuss. So the Vasa seminar was a discussing forum for Scandinavian uh, actors. This was my model. So I thought, I, I do a seminar also, but not to discuss, but on practical experience. So I had a Grotowski, and of course, I was, since I want to learn and, and uh, this was also a way for my actors to, to learn. Uh, I was interested in, in, in physical and vocal techniques. I was not interested in ideas. Ideas that uh, I have been reading. I knew all the ideas I have been reading. So, uh, I, I want the models and how they were doing this. I was interested in, let me say, the, uh, the process, not in the results. And therefore, if you see the, 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 the first seminars, who were the teachers here? They were pantomime, people, who, the, the, which in that very moment was the, a, a sort of shock in Europe to see uh, uh, Tomaszewski's pantomime in Poland, uh, Marcel Marceau in France. They were powerful performances which really physically touched you without words. This was unbelievable because the, the theater at the time was a text. So, um, a opera singer for Wolfgang. Then uh, I invited Dario Fo. The, the first time Dario Fo came abroad, went abroad, was here in Osebro to do a, a seminar. So, then after 68, when uh, the group, the theater, the, 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 the group, theater cultures, uh, spread all over the world. What you remember, I called this transformative, the generation which really thought the theater could be a transformative uh, tool. 
after that, when seminars and courses and workshops was very natural, then I began to make, in early 70s, seminars of what was my secret passion, the uh, Asian actors. I'd been seen Katakali in 63, but uh, I was dreaming of all other Asian uh, performances, and therefore we invited huge, huge ensembles. I mean, once we made, and this was one of the reasons why of bankrupt, or the first mm -hmm. bankrupt of all the theater was, when I invited a no company, a, a, a kabuki company, and a, a, a contemporary uh, Shimpa uh, theater group, Terayama, and there were about 80 Japanese arriving here in Osaka. Orlando Furioso of Ronconi's performance, which had such an influence also. After Belgrade, which when, uh, uh, was shown abroad, the second place abroad was here in Osterbro. I could tell you how I financed it, because all this is not that I went to the mayor and gave me money. He didn't give me money. I, we were not recognized by the Minister of Culture, because in Denmark exists only municipal theaters at that time, and no other town, uh, the theaters in small towns. So the, 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 the theater law didn't uh, uh, envisage, didn't uh, deal with other theaters which uh, uh, could happen. So we were the first theater in the province. And the poor mayor could not help us in convincing the Minister of Culture that we were also doing sort of work, uh, just like other theaters. But then, uh, but the, the strategies of financing all this, this is I, what I consider a very important part of my creativity. The fact that I've been able to give every month for 56 years a salary to my uh, actors. And this is what keeps the company alive. If I, the moment when we have had huge crisis, and then say I can't pay for two months, one month, two months, three months, they started working outside, and therefore they could not be at my disposition 24 hours a day, because the salary is not very big, but it's enough to survive, it depends. Know how much you uh, earn, but how much you spend. If you live in a small town, you live much, much cheaper than if you live in Copenhagen. This is one of my reasons of staying in a small town, because it's much cheaper. Which, uh, which was the strategy to bring these three? What? Which was the strategy to bring these three theater companies? <coughs> it, the strategy was this. I, I, I met uh, I, I knew Dario Fo because I had met him in Italy during a, a, a meeting where I had been invited. I was a very good friend of a young theater critic, Franco Quadri, who became a very important critic. But he was the main, um, one of the main uh, 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 protagonists in creating in Italy a movement and gathering all these young artists. Uh, who, who were uh, refunding the Italian theater. So <clears throat> I had to finance this. Uh, uh, Dario Fo was at the time well known as uh, uh, author of comedies, and his comedies were performed with success in Scandinavia. So I started asking all these theaters who had been uh, um, uh, performing op, if they were interested in uh, uh, having a, a, a performance by Dario Fo. Mm -hmm. They had been thinking that it, 
you could, they could invite, especially in Italy, etc. And a huge work of administration, and I would say of managing. Uh, somebody has said the best manager in theater in, in the 20th century is Eugenio Barba. <laughs> and it's true. I'm a good, until now, I guess. So this was a way I managed to sell uh, the performance of Dario Fo, who for the first time came to Orsabru, then went straight to the Royal Theater in Copenhagen, then went to Viveka Bandler, a lone director in Stockholm, and then called it. But even more amusing was with uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Orlando Furioso. Because it was completely unknown, the young uh, uh, Ronconi at that, uh, at that time. So, um, uh, so I had this idea. I went and spoke with the director of the uh, shopkeepers uh, union here in Orsebro. Mm -hmm. All the shopkeepers. A shop where you go and buy anything. Mm -hmm. All the owners, mm -hmm. they are gathered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they are gathered in order to defend their uh, or, or make certain. Uh, now they do this. At that time they were not doing this. So the celebration. And then I proposed to, 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 uh, to them that we can make something which is unique, a performance, etc. <laughs> uh, but it, it was very expensive. And I never, I don't believe that you go to. Uh, rich people, people who have money and say, help culture. I don't believe. They don't. They, they are not interested in this. They are interested in something which comes back. Then I say to them, now listen, if you say to all the other shop owners that if people buy for 100 crowns, they will receive a free ticket for this performance. You have just to ask your uh, members of the, that for every 100 crowns that people buy, so, and then 1%, just one crown, can give, be given to you, and you give it to me. Very elaborated. <laughs> but he accepted. He accepted. The result was that I was able to have this money. What is the interesting that we performed four times here in Orsebro? I was unable, because they want us to sell at least six performances abroad. I was unable to find a place for them. So I decided, OK, uh, we went to a shipyard, spoke with the uh, in, uh, uh, close to Odense. And uh, we uh, spoke with the uh, uh, representative of the workers, and our workers are not interested in culture. So I'm not, I was sure that I was not going to receive any money, so I didn't ask for money. I only asked if they would give us the place so that we could come and perform. So we financed two performances. In uh, I think it was Munkebu is the name of the shipyard, no? the shipyard which belonged, and then yeah, Munkebu. So I did. It. But like this all the time, it, it has been a sort of way how to get money. If you think that Odin Tatchet until today makes performance for 25 spectators. 50 spectators, 60 spectators, when we become very, very 120 spectators. You can't uh, uh, earn with, with tickets. I mean, you can live. If you do a performance, Dario Fo was doing a performance for several hundreds, and uh, tickets can give you independence. Think of Broadway, think of the, the theater in London. I mean, the, there are many, many theaters whose, whose economical financial management makes them independent without help of the state. So, but the, the main, the, we start working with projects. These were 
things which helped us to earn money. So, earn money, and you will have all the actors you wish. <laughs> or opposite, the directors, if you want to. As a director, what specific characteristics are you looking for when in an actor in, in order to take in your company? One characteristic, that he comes and wants to work with me. <laughs> Usually I say no. <laughs> and then if he insists and they find a way of infiltrating, becoming <laughs> friends of an actor, etc. Then I see them around. A bit. I tell you the story of uh, a, an actress who has had a huge, huge influence in this, uh, in this group. It's Eben. Eben, when we moved from Norway to Denmark, I received a letter of a, uh, her mother asking if uh, the daughter could apply for becoming actor. I don't know if even has told you how she came to all the interpreters. Has she told you? Well, she, she was an addict, a drug addict, and in a very, very bad shape. A boy, uh, you will see tonight her story. She will, she has made a performance, a very interesting performance about her biography. <clears throat> and um, her uh, boyfriend committed suicide because of the drug. She was uh, almost on the verge of doing this. And then, casually, by accident, she saw the first performance of Odin Tatchet. And then she said, it's the only place. I, want, I, I could uh, work with these people. And then she told this to the mother and father. Uh, she is the daughter of a very, very famous uh, poet uh, in Denmark, and uh, the mother is also a writer. So she came. And when she came, she was simply not in physical. Uh, condition for that type of work we were doing. Because I had at that time, and I still have today, the idea that I want to show, or you have to show me your motivation concretely, working hard from early in the morning to late in the evening. If you show this to me, so I start having trust in you, I trust you. Otherwise it's blah, 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 blah. Everybody can speak a lot. Mm -hmm. So this was the way I was selecting my actors. But true, making them work very hardly. And of course, if they work very hardly, they become independent. They find their own way. And therefore, slowly, this became a sort of uh, an artistic uh, environment where each one developed their own projects. And then also, we had a collective project, which were making performance together with my, um, uh, as a director, with me as a director, or other projects like uh, tournée or the festive week with a huge organization or celebration of our town, which we organize every three years. So we had certain activities in, in together, and then all of them have their own activities. In the 70s, in the early 70s, it even came to me, it was the moment where really all the theater became a point of reference for all these young groups arising, and for many of them anyway. And even came and said, but Eugenio, we, we have, there are so many young actors, interesting, you should take them in, your, in our group. Easy to say, uh, but I have no money because my principle is that if an actor comes, he has to receive a salary. And not that from the very beginning, all 
people who come here, they first year receive 25%, second year 50%, third year 75%, fourth year the same salary as everybody. Everybody here receives the same salary. So, but I, I have no the money. I can guarantee the money to these seven, eight actors only, no more. And then she insisted, essentially. And then one day I got very irritated and said, even if you want, if you want, I don't want new people, if you want to have pupils or young actors, you can do this, you adopt them, but not only you are going to teach them, but you also have to pay without your own pocket for them. Now, I said, okay, she did it. So she, told, she, she adopted two, a boy and a girl. They remained 10 years, both of them, in the audience theater. Tony Goss is one adopted, and Cindy Ricciardelli, who is now actress, when she left, went <coughs> back to Italy. We began at that time at 7 o'clock in the morning. Eben began at 5 o'clock in the morning with them. She worked with them. Then I came. I ignored them. They were not exist for me. <laughs> <laughs> they passed a bit like Icarus. You are there, I don't see you. Uh, when we finished in the evening, 5, 6, sometimes 8 o'clock, she started working with them. Her example, was followed by Tage, and Tage adopted two actors. The boy, Francis Pardellan, who also remained 10 years here, and then Julia. So I never been working with Julia. Julia came, I was very detailed that she came in. She <coughs> uh, <laughs> In addition, she was doing political theater. She had the head full of all this political blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but okay, she remained there. And then one and a half year passed. And I have to admit that these four people were really people I could trust because they were hard workers. So one day I gathered all of them and said, okay, they are no longer adoptive stepsons and daughters and uh, Odin actors, all of them are actors, Odin actors, and then I began to pay them. But this was a period where I, I had great problems because the economy was uh, uh, much more. I, I ca cannot afford to pay every month for uh, 11, there were 11 actors at that time. So this is to, to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to tell you how the, uh, the, the actors, my attitudes towards the actors. I, most of the, the actors I have a huge, most respect for are those who were in a way handicapped in the beginning. People like Julia, who has not a voice which according to normal uh, norms, to normal, she, she could never, she can sing in a very strange way, and uh, this is broken, but uh, at the same time she's been able to, to develop a very fascinating system of working, which for many, many people is very inspiring. But also, uh, as Eben, for instance, the, the way she, for many years, Eben was a sort of shadow, for two, three, four years, she was a sort of shadow with a small mouse, gray mouse, and then suddenly became, became a tiger, a dragon. And believe me, in the 70s, even was a sort of icon, both in Latin America and Europe, for theater groups. The way her wildness, her technical, uh, she made the first demonstration in the early, uh, the end of the 70s. You no, know, she, she has been a sort of huge, huge, inspiration for the, the generation was in uh, all the time.
So this is what I'm expecting of an actor. They are a bit stupid and work very hard. <laughs> I say stupid in the sense that they are not thinking uh, what is useful and what uh, to, to what is uh, uh, sensible. Ah, this is not sensible. Yeah, for nuftik, ragionevole, reasonable, reasonable. Yeah, not reasonable. <laughs> What is the target group for you or for the auditor? You are my target group, those who come to me. Now I can stay in here and do here I am and people come. No, all, not many, you see, very few. But I believe in small uh, ciphers, small numbers. Did you ever think of directing a movie? Because, mm, no. Movie is, uh, is to do with the, uh, uh, this technology, <laughs> which is, uh, I'm, very, I'm very impatient. Every time I've been dealing with the films, uh, Torge, for instance, was a very, very good a filmmaker, really exceptional. And, um, uh, but every time he was uh, doing a film uh, and all the actors were there, they were, we had to wait a long, oh no, just a moment of the light, oh no, just a moment that we have to change the, the battery. It's impossible, there's no, no concentration, it's a completely different uh, way of working. So film doesn't interest me, but I must say that uh, film has been a huge inspiration for me. Uh, starting from Eisenstein. Eisenstein, as you know, the Russian filmmaker, he began as a theater director and he was one of the best pupils of Mayfield. And then he made a very interesting performances. He wrote in 1921, 20, 21, yeah, a, a manifest, which is a, a, not only a manifest, but also a, a sort of a vision of how the work of the actor should be. And he called the uh, uh, attractions. He said that any time the actor is performing, for instance, I. Uh, Fall in love, and uh, to fall in love it means that uh, there is a, like a, a sort of salto mortale, uh, and then I say, boom, I do a salto mortale, literally on the stage, in order to show that I am in love. So this was the attraction. Attraction is what emotionally the actor physically is ab able to to show with an attraction, a physical attraction uh, of the, the inner reactions and. Uh, 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 feelings, emotions. So it was the performances he was doing. He was doing with reality with circus artists, mm -hmm. because uh, normal actors, especially those uh, at that time uh, educated according to Stanislavski uh, uh, way, would not be able to do this. Uh, he was also influenced by Melkorn, where the actors, the physicality of the training, of the apprenticeship was very important. So, <clears throat> and this has been, uh, it's very interesting because uh, all the idea of montage starts from uh, Einstein. Einstein starts thinking that the film is a, you see a film, but the, the montage of this film is not only the attractions, the visual attractions of the actor, but also the emotional montage is very refined. It is the music. So that, when you read the study Einstein, then you have in, in, in Nuce, in, 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 in its essence, what are the, uh, the source of inspiration for me, uh, which of course have been developed, but from the very beginning, when I was reading all this, when I was a student in Poland, where it made huge, huge impact. But 
They were abstract until I began. I lost the language when I, from Norway, came here, Denmark. Then I saw how the montage, the emotional montage, the music, the, the, the fact that the, although I can speak and this, the, the spectator doesn't understand sonority, the melody, the intonation uh, of the voice can say something. No mean. There is huge difference. This performance you have seen says something to me. But maybe it doesn't mean anything. Uh, <clears throat> if I see a woman who is embracing a baby, this doesn't mean anything. But it says a lot to me. If you go outside in the sunset and see the sunset, and then suddenly the whole landscape becomes red, it doesn't mean anything, but it says to me. So is it possible to make performances which say something to the spectator, although they, they seem not to have a meaning? I understand. This is a bit like my mayor who said, ah, there is no, nothing happens here uh -huh, because there is no culture. You always have to be able to find the question which is a, a, a good trampoline for your own way of becoming active. I have the, the, my pockets are full of all new questions. <laughs> <laughs> I change every day. I find them. At the present time, and despite the financial difficulties, what is the Odin Theatre's biggest challenge? <laughs> the biggest challenge is that our uh, Fiscal machine doesn't work anymore as it worked before. That we become, are becoming older and older. Some of us cannot move fingers. Roberta, arthritis, one hand is almost paralyzed. Young, yesterday he was telling me that can't play with three fingers, so you can only play with two fingers. Our adapting. There are mo smallest things to go down to kneel or to to come up on the chair. I have, uh, you will see uh, the performance of uh, Simari. I hope it will take place. <laughs> She's 75, and uh, the other actor who is not an actor, but in reality is a composer who also plays instrument. He has Parkinson. So when you see him, he has to play violin. So <laughs> it's not very easy to play violin if you have that. So, so <clears throat> this is our challenge. We were, you haven't seen, you haven't seen, you haven't seen now the, only the chronic life. And then there is uh, costumes. So you have no idea of the age. But uh, you, when you start seeing uh, the other performances, collective performances, the first thing which strikes you is to see that this is an old people home in reality. All of them are very, very old. And they show it, their age. There is a performance where all <laughs> the actors are just sitting there. And we were performing in Paris, yes. and uh, several spectators afterwards told me that the first shock was to come and see so many old people on stage. <laughs> because they, they never see old people on stage in such amount. 
So this is the challenge, not only to be on stage sitting, but also be able to move a little. <laughs> you see, it is unjust, it's extremely unjust. You can be an honest person all your life, and the last day you are caught stealing an apple from a supermarket, and then your reputation, your eftermele, will be completely destroyed. So one can say that the conclusion decides for the, what people will say about you. So how you die, how you disappear, is very important. So, all the intelligent, uh, the, the core of, of the actors, there are about 10 of us, we have been together more than 30 years, 40 years, some, some 55 years. <coughs> we have wrote a document, we call it Declaration for the Future. Mm -hmm. This is our testament. Where we say that when the last of us the, the dies or doesn't want to do any more theater, all in theaters must disappear. No one can use our name. All in theaters are the relationships of these people who have been together for so many years. So this is, uh, let's say, the, the challenge. Are we going to be able to let all in theater die? Because the municipality doesn't want all in theater to die. But even if we, all of us, the old, who have been doing this, they want that all the entire remains because it's become a sort of uh, wear, good wear, you know, like Nike or Coca-Cola or I don't know what. <laughs> so <laughs> for us, my, my fight is now so that we want to die, we want to disappear. So. Yes, I think that I have all the rest here are uh, order. Okay. Uh, now, oh, this is huge. What is a dramaturg? Somebody asks. So a dramaturg is something which uh, <coughs> is a bit like a, the anthropologist. Who is an anthropologist? An anthropologist in the beginning were Emigrants, Jews, uh, discriminated people, uh, people who came from the province to the to the capital, and the, uh, the students in the university say, oh, 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 "We are coming from Berlin," <laughs> and they became anthropologists with the excuse that they could go and study others. They managed to exorcise their situation and discrimination. So they, this helped them to feel that I don't belong to any culture. I can, am able to have empathy with this culture, of course, also with my culture. But uh, so, so the dramaturg is a sort of, uh, <clears throat> let's say, intelligent uh, person who in life lives, uh, was living in the shadow of theater, but not being a very important, because it is not an independent, separate function. Because uh, you had the play, and in all days, the owner of the company, the main actor, the actor manager was called. He was also the one who decided, no, oh, this Shakespeare is too long, if we cut to this, and then you, you can say this. And the, the thing which any director, there's working with the text. But in the uh, 49, when in 49, when Bertolt Brecht came back to Europe and uh, or to Germany, East Germany, Berlin, East Berlin, and he opened the, uh, started the Berliner Ensemble. This was really this big, this big, 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 big 
revolution in theater uh, after the Second World War. The performances of the Berlin Ensemble were something which so astonishing, which had nothing to do with the all other performances, in spite that they were very good directors in France or in Italy, but they were all, in reality, influenced, practically speaking, by Brecht's Berlin Ensemble. The performances he did himself as a director. And then he, 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 had the, he, he had a group of people who were also young directors, but also intellectuals, with whom dramaturgiat, he called a sort of collective mind. We call it collective mind here when we gather people who work together with us and we try to solve certain situations connected to the rehearsals. So it was calling dramaturg was a, 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 a person who is able in uh, dealing with the text, for the text was very important, and the way the text is transposed in theater by the actor. So in this transposition, he found that uh, th this dramaturg helped. So especially in Germany, there is now a, a a, a, a position, a job in the theater where there is a dramaturg, the one who is expert in taking a text and helping the director. But for instance, this sort of dramaturg, I am. Roberta has been a dramaturg because she has been chosen the text and she has been putting together and then she has been also her own director, etc. So this is a dramaturg. Can I ask a thing? Yeah. Maybe it's a stupid question, actually, but I was wondering why uh, you told us that you don't give advice. What? Why? You told us that you don't give advice. Advice. Yeah. What? Advice. Advice. Why should I give advice? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Um, if somebody you don't know comes and can you give me an advice, would you give an advice to this person? No, but... Um, I don't know, maybe it's not the right, the right um, word to say that. It's maybe um, when somebody has, has lived so many things in life, maybe um, understand something that you don't in that sense. Be careful. Of course, if Roberta comes and says, would you give me an advice? Of course, I sit down and listen carefully and say what I mean. But when people come and say, what would you, which advice would you say to a young actor who has no money, has difficulty in finding a company? I say, go and work, start uh, working, getting up two hours before the usual. What time you get up? Seven o'clock. Get up at five o'clock. You will see that within one year you will get, this is my advice. Get up two hours before. <laughs> <laughs> The decision-making of a theme or author's text over another is made by the director. Or do the actors also participate in that process? For collective, um, for the ensemble performances, it's all I would decide. Uh, the we will be, this will be the framework of the narration because the performance is a, you are narrating something, a story. The story can be a, uh, only f with four characters, five characters, and this, you follow, or there can be different characters with different stories, multiple, just like in the chronic life, for instance. When it comes to the individual, uh, the solos, you have seen, most of them, uh, the initiative comes from the actors. So the actors came, uh, let's see the, the oldest one, Judith. Uh, Roberta uh, went to Japan and worked with uh, uh, Natsu Nakajima who is a very close friend of Kazuo now. 
and also of Ichikata, the founders of Obudo. She, uh, they, they, this is very interesting, the way of working on Buto, because they work, they, they are teaching by making the actors imitating uh, the master or the, the teacher. So she built a structure. So when she came back after one month, Roberta had the structure. But which was uh, represented or presented according to the Buto styles. You know, Buto, mm -hmm. all of you. And then I said, but Robert, <laughs> we, can't, we can't use this because Buto. Uh, but then Roberta uh, uh, had a problem because she had had a child. And this child was now six, should go to school, so she could not anymore travel with her, this child. So I said to her, you know what, we find a solution. We make a solo performance, so you will not be participating with the ensemble performance, but you, when you have time, you can do this. So you can remain and work and earn and be useful to all us. And then I start working on... <laughs> now, what happened was that uh, <laughs> in the, 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 all the time the, the, this was the, the, the Buddha dynamics. So all the structures, all the movements went all the time and then going down and then falling on the floor and and then I start thinking, what, how, I have to justify this moment. What, what can it be? Can't be a body because it's too big. It was very ill. And then it, it must be. And then I thought a head. And then I start thinking of all the stories I knew. And then I came over to Judith. And then I proposed this. Okay, we can do this on Judith. So I start out of this. I took the text of the beginning text of the Bible and uh, I uh, uh, changed it and, and, and so I took all the texts uh, which she says, you see, she says very little, very few texts just to, uh, and then um, I began working. We invented the new scenes. But my greatest job was to clean her for the Buddha, so that the spectators would not recognize Buddha. So this, so this was the case, for instance. Uh, uh, <coughs> Ave Maria began because when uh, Julia, when uh, Maria Canepa died, Julia said, I would like to make a performance about Maria Canepa because she was very attached to her. I want her to continue to live mm -hmm. uh, through a, a colleague, an actress uh, activity. And I also wanted this, but I was in reality uh, interested as a director how you evoke a dead person uh, in such a way that the spectator becomes really that it says something to that spectator. Because if I tell the story of Maria Canepa, who was the most important actress in traditional theater in Chile uh, until 2010, well, we, we can be seen, you know, but, but this private, there is, and you can make your reflections on the performance about Roberta. Uh, of Roberta, because when we work, we work all the time within two dimensions. One is the private one, and the other is the personal one. If I tell a story which is private, very often risks of remaining private, and use expressive means 
which falls unwillingly into sentimentality. When you work with personal, in the personal dimension, you here to make a completely estranging process. Remember the, uh, the principle of estrangement. You have to tell a story. And then the story which you are inventing obliges you to forget the, the, the private and go over into something which is also a result not only of your own biographic experiences, but also of your fantasy and your shrewdness as a, 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 an actor, a director. Shrewdness, astuteness, how to uh, smartness, how I can manipulate the uh, uh, associations of the spectators because the, the what is the what gives when when Kandinsky was saying a point a dot is not it is just stops is entropy you have to do movement 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 and then you have a line what is if you start thinking the corresponding the equivalent way of thinking for the spectator for me as a director, I have all the time to give you a dot or a stimulus so that your brain uh, begins to associate, to be stimulated. And then I have to find another one. And I find another. I can't rest within the same uh, atmosphere or uh, uh, repeating. Uh, the, the same situation all the time there must be a slight change and this it makes that what is private can be transformed into something personal so for me the, the story in, in Ave Maria from a professional point of view as a director was how can I I was also very fond of Maria Canepa I've been dealing or sharing with Julia, uh, long, long periods together with her and her husband. But I find a story which allowed me to tell the biography, but without, not just telling directly. Somebody was telling me today that the most, the best the communication is not the direct one, but the indirect one. So this is a very, very clever, very, very clever uh, formulation. So when you say I'm narrating something, in reality it is that you are uh, finding an indirect way of uh, telling uh, something which uh, could be also uh, said directly but which becomes much more effective uh, uh, through the, uh, the labyrinth, like that you are going in one direction, then go in go, go another direction. Deviation, how to deviate. Uh, you understand this deviation, the word deviation. Uh, Also, you ask me, somebody, you balance it, have you balanced being the outer eye versus participated in the physical exploration exercises? I never, I never been doing any training. I never found it interesting. I can't understand actors who want to do it. But <laughs> no, I'm outside. I like to sit there comfortably, possibly, and, uh, and watch. But I am a huge uh, sensitive membrana. All my kinesthetic senses work. And 
the eye can at once react if the actor is doing a such which does not correspond to something which simulates me. So I think that for becoming an actor who wants to communicate indirectly through the kinesthetic sense, not only through the, directly through the world, uh, you have to go through an apprenticeship which makes your body think uh, in its totality. But uh, as a director, it's not necessary. I don't think so. I like to read. I read a lot. But I know that you are not a good director because you have a lot of ideas. Most of the ideas you have as a director and you think they are fantastic when you start working with an actor that you have to give uh, up because the actor is always, there is a re reason, the actor, because the, you know why the actor will always be the protagonist in theatre? Because he represents the human. And as a spectator, I can recognize what is human as a sort of physical archetype, because I, I, I have the same, the same evolution as my actor. I stand from the fishes. I was living on the floor, and I was afraid of uh, spiders, of snakes. I am afraid of, of darkness because darkness and uh, the age of, 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 uh, of, of, of the of stone age when there was no even fire maybe was the, 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 the condition of danger. So there are many things I share with the, uh, the humanity as human. Are you able to theater to make the spectators evoke it with his physicality, with the intelligence and the memory of his bodies, the different memories. We have different memories. But without knowing it, it, it this is a part of the work where there is no method. I am very blind. I, I know that I would like to arrive there, but I have no method. I can't teach my actors do it like this. So the only thing I can do is try this, the same function. I try this again and, and try this and oh, make it bigger. Oh, make it bigger. Well, just like she was telling uh, uh, Julia. One day the director comes and make it slow. And the second day she comes and no, make it slower. <laughs> Third day they go make it quick. This is the way I, I, I find that. Uh, there, there, the spider. I'm afraid of the spider. But we must have particular actors accustomed to this sort of work and which really love their director, otherwise, mm -hmm. despite the this one. No, I don't want. Do you want the uh, your pieces to be played uh, uh, 30, 40, 50 years ahead from now? in the hands of other actors? No, because what we have seen is the unique expression of Roberta, Giulia, uh, Eben. No. What Julia does is because she has a broken voice and can't go and search for an actor. An actor with a beautiful voice would not function. Vulnerability, what, what most fascinates us when we see the human vulnerability, no oh, strength. And therefore, a mother with a child is m maybe the one of the most, uh, the strongest image, because we have the vulnerability, the beauty of, uh, of the oppositions of oxymoron, the, 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 the future life and already the life of the mother who is going towards the sunset. <coughs> I have a feeling that 
I have exceeded for four minutes the uh, the time. So, thank you for your passion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andiamo a continuare la nostra interazione.